Uh, Proverbs chapter number 29. Let's get into the sermon here. Proverbs chapter number 29. Look with me at verse number 18. So I'm going to be preaching a sermon this morning on the importance of setting goals. I'm going to be using verse number 18 as it, you know, is... You know, uh, uh, in Orthodox, traditionally, this is a very famous verse for this purpose. And I want to focus on the very first statement in Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 18. The Bible says this, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. So I'm going to be preaching this morning on why we need to have visions or why we need to have goals in our Christian lives. And I'm going to be preaching this sermon in, in, a, in a very systematic way. There's going to be a lot of sub points and there's, I'm going to be giving advice on how to set goals. I'm going to be giving the types of goals that you should be setting, the areas where you need to be growing. And, and also I'm going to be giving you the areas over who and whom these goals need to be set. Now, whether that be a husband, father, that, whether that be the church, and then also on an individual uh, uh, level. So, there needs to be visions and there needs to be goals in every Christian's life. And without a goal, without any sort of marker, you're going to perish, the Bible. You're not going to succeed. I want you to go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. In the very beginning of the sermon also here, I'm going to make some opening remarks, some introductory statements. They're going to set the tone. And I want to uh, define specifically what types of goals that I am speaking about this morning. Because, hey, you may have personal goals in your life that are somewhat secular. Hey, hey thriving at your job overlaps with being a good steward, being faithful. That should be driven, that, that desire of being a good worker should be driven by your Christian character in the first place. But that's not specifically what I'm talking about. Today I'm talking about things that are going to more so affect eternity. Things that are wrapped up and, 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 and correlate with the church and spiritual things. I want to talk about the importance of these goals being spiritual. First and foremost, yes, you should have goals in all of your life. But first and foremost, those goals should be spiritual goals. Look at Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 33 with me. The Bible says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness... And all these things shall be added unto you. So in our lives, what we should be seeking after, our goal that we should be looking after or seeking after should be Christ's righteousness, should be God's righteousness, should be the Bible, should be things of a spiritual nature. That should be what is most important. Enough. So if you have goals in your life, you need to make sure personally that your secular goals, your personal goals, your maybe even worldly goals are not trumping or preceding the goals that have to do with righteousness, the goals that have to do with the Bible. I understand sometimes how we can get our priorities wrong. That happens even in every person's life. It's happened to me many a times where you start to focus on your job. You start to see, hey, I'm, I'm getting ahead. You know, I've, I've been you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, promoted in this area. Or maybe the opposite, maybe you're seeking a new career or whatever it may be. I have been put in so many different situations where my goals have been flopped around because my attention has, has you know, necessarily been drawn to this area of life. Maybe I you know, uh, you know, uh, have more responsibilities given to me at work. And what ends up happening is you start focusing on that in your life more. So it's important to make sure that we never allow those goals in our lives. Hey, you have to live in the world, I understand that. You have to have a job, you have to own things, you have to have possessions, you have to go to work and, and do all of these things. Women have their own responsibilities that will tie in with worldly things. But you need to make sure that a lot, when, you're, when it comes to your priorities list and the things that you set goals for in your life, that you're not fixated on the things of this world and just completely ignoring the things of the Bible. You need to make sure that the goals that you have in your life, primarily the goals that you have in your life are spiritual goals. That's where you need to be focusing on. Not where you are in your career. Not where you are you know, on the ladder in economics or whatever it may be. You need to be looking and examining and, and, and doing an analysis on yourself spiritually and saying, hey, am I further along in my spiritual walk? than I was two years ago, or have I backed up? Am I doing worse today than I was a year ago, or am I doing better? You need to look at, and that's what you need to be concerned about, because when you're 70, 80, 90 years old, that's not what you're going to care about, as far as economics. You're not going to be worried about what job you had when you're 30 years old, 40 years old. That's not what you're going to be concerned about. 
When you die and, and 2,000 years into eternity, you're not going to be reflecting upon your life and saying, hey, I wish I would have made this better decision with my work when I was 28. I wish I would have accepted that promotion. That's not what you're going to be concerned about into eternity. So we need to make sure that we have the right perspective of life. We need to make sure that what we're seeking is first the kingdom of God. Our goals need to be primarily spiritual. Our goals in our life, we need to be focusing on things that are spiritual, that have to do with the Lord, that have to do with the Bible, that have to do with things that are eternal, things that we cannot see, right? So a goal is an objective. That is what a goal is. A goal is something that you are endeavoring or that you desire to achieve. It is something that you are seeking after, right? And oftentimes when we hear the word goal, it causes you to think of sports or athletics. And if you look at every sport, whatever it may be, there exists some sort of goal in that practice or in that activity, right? If you look at football, there's something that's called a field goal. They have uprights. There's, you know, the, 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 the vertical bars and then there's the horizontal bar and you need to kick the ball between there. And when you do, that's called a goal. It's called a field goal, right? You have uh, soccer. That's the other one. You have soccer. It's almost the same exact situation. You have the uprights. You have the, the vertical bars. Then you have the horizontal bar. There's a net. And what do you need to do? You need to get the ball in there. And when you do so, you have you know, uh, accomplish a goal. You have scored a goal. Basketball. There's a, there's a basket, right, in basketball. And there is a net that's attached to it, there, to the rim. There is a metal rim. And the objective or the goal is to put the basket in, or put the ball into the basket. And that is a goal, right? That is the objective. So when they're playing sports, what are they trying to do? They're trying to make a goal. That is their goal. So they have something that they are desiring or something that they are seeking after. Oftentimes in the Bible, we, we see that the Christian life is, uh, um, it, it is likened or paralleled with sports or with athletics. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Most Christians, when you look around today, they do not look like they are seeking after a goal. They do not look like that they are striving for mastery or that they are trying to win something. They don't even have close to the same type of attitude that sports figures have. They do not have the same type of motive or the same type of desire to do well or to succeed at the Christian life than LeBron James does or whatever football, basketball figure that you can think of, any sports figure. You know, what we are doing in our Christian lives is far more important than what they're doing. But isn't it kind of funny, isn't it kind of embarrassing that sports figures today care more about accomplishing their goals than Christians do? Look with me here at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, towards the end of the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, look at verse number 24. <clears throat> it says this, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. And then he says this, But one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. So notice what Paul just said. He explains that those that are running in a race, like an actual, if you will, marathon, there is a race that they are running. And he explains here that they are running to receive a prize. But he, he also goes further and says, don't you know that only one of them receives that prize? So he likens that type of race under the Christian life when he makes this statement. He says, so run, talking to you, Christian, talking about the Christian life, the race is the Christian life. He says, so run, and then he says this, that ye may obtain. That should be motivating to you. Paul is telling you you need to run in the Christian life. You need to run the Christian race so that you may obtain, that you may reach the goal. You need to have a marker. You need to have a vision or a goal in your Christian life. You need to be striving to get to that finish line. Look at what it says in verse number 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So notice that statement, striving for the mastery. Mastery is like the word victory. So talking about striving, talking about, you know, endeavoring, right? Competing for the mastery, competing for a victory. They're striving for a mastery. Then it goes on to say this, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Talking about those that, that compete in real literal uh, athletics. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we an incorruptible. 
So the crown that we receive, he explains, is incorruptible. The Bible talks about this crown that fades not away in another book, in, in uh, Peter's writings. It says in verse 26, I therefore so run. So now he's talking personally about himself. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Then he goes on, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So notice that Paul at the end of that as well, that he explains that he is running this race. And that he is desiring to obtain the prize. Our Christian lives, in our Christian lives, we need to be striving for the mastery. We need to be striving for a victory. We need to have motivation. We need to have a goal that we are trying to obtain. If there is something you are trying to obtain, it would be a goal. There needs to be a goal set in order to have a race that you're running. There has to be a finish line. That finish line would be the goal. Now, when, you, when it's compared unto sports, notice what he points out to you. The whole purpose of this is to motivate you. When he compares it unto athletics, when he compares it unto literal sports, he explains that what they're competing for, their prize, he says, is a corruptible crown. The trophy that they would receive or whatever it may be, whatever that reward is, it's corruptible, isn't it? What is it going to do? It talks about, you know, uh, rust and and moth can eat the things of this world and it will burn up, right? It's corruptible because it's of this world. But then he explains to you that the crown that you're striving for is incorruptible. Isn't that great? When you sit down and you stop and think about that for a minute. I want to take that further. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but I want to make two points to you quickly. Number one, the crown that you receive, I want you to think of this, and this is of course what it's explaining. This, you, you, I'm sure you've ran through your mind. The crown or reward or whatever that you receive when you get into heaven will be with you for all eternity. Think about that. That's why it's incorruptible. The crown that you receive, the rewards that you get, will be with you for all eternity. I wanted to word that in such a way to help you to understand that and for it to set in in your minds, to soak in in your minds. When, when Christ gives you that reward, you're going to keep it forever. For all eternity, millions, billions of years, it's going to go on, right? You're going to have that reward. You're going to have that crown forever. But I want to make a second point to you that maybe you haven't thought about before. Whatever reward or whatever crown that you receive initially or when you enter into heaven, that's what you're stuck with or that's what you get for all eternity. Do you hear what I said? Whatever Christ awards you with, whatever rewards that, it, that you receive, that's what you're going to have for all eternity. You know what that means? You don't get another shot at it. You don't get another opportunity. There, there isn't, hey, next season, right? So when you have someone that competes for a race and they lose and they get second or third place, by the, at the end of the race, what are they thinking? I can tell you when I played in, in tournaments, you know, uh, uh, oftentimes the teams I played on were very good, but we would lose all the time as well. We'd lose in the championship constantly. And you know what I would always be thinking on the ride home? I'm returning to this tournament next year when they have it and we're beating that team. There's always next season or there's always next year. If you played, you know, in regionals and you lost in regionals, the goal was to go to state and the goal was to play in the championship game. And when you lose in regionals, you know what everybody's thinking? We're going to come back and we're going to do better next year and we're going to defeat this team next year. When you die and your race is finished, it's finished. And whatever Christ gives you at the judgment and whatever rewards you are awarded with, that's what you receive for all eternity. And there is no more opportunity to receive any additional rewards. If you stand before Christ and He is not pleased with you at judgment, that's your only chance. He's not pleased with you at the only judgment that you receive from the life that you live. The only life that you'll live. And then you enter into eternity with that forever. You only get one shot at it. It's like the senior year, right? You only have one shot. This is, your, this is your only opportunity. Whatever you get when you enter into heaven, that, those are the rewards that you will have for eternity. Or lack thereof. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 9 says this, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, notice what this says, we may be accepted of Him. There are going to be Christians that are going to stand before Christ, that 
he will not be pleased with, with the only life and the only opportunity that they were given. Yeah, they're saved. Yeah, you know, they're going to heaven and they're going to be in heaven forever. But as far as the works that you've done, he's given you a great opportunity to earn more rewards. He's given you a great opportunity, but you only have this one life. You only have this one opportunity. You don't get to cash in for another life. You don't get a second opportunity or a second shot or another season where you can come back and, hey, I want to, you know, give another shot at it. I want to try one more time. Once it's over, it's over. You don't have another chance. So when you die, that's it. And whatever rewards that he gives you, that's what you have for eternity. That's it. Whatever crown you get or crowns, that's all you get. And you won't be able to acquire or accumulate another crown. You won't be able to achieve another goal. So we need to take the time that we have in this life. We need to understand how precious time is and how precious life is. And we need to understand what is important. And we need to make sure that we have our priorities straight in life. Our attention can be pulled away at other things that are, that are necessary at times. But we need to make sure that we have our eye on the true prize. That we have our eye on the incorruptible crown. And not all the things that corrupt and the things that do fade away in this life. So at this point I'm going to go into a couple of tips in the sermon. I want to give you a couple of tips before I actually talk about the goals that you should be setting in your life. I'm going to give you a few different tips. I believe I have two here. Two different tips on how to set goals. Not what types of goals to set, but how to set goals. And this is how I set goals in my life. And I've always been this type of person that's probably related to sports, but I constantly have goals in my life that I have written down in a notebook, and I'll lose that notebook, but I know what they are, and I'll go back and rewrite those goals down repeatedly. I do this constantly. I've always done this. You know, ever since, you know, uh, 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 probably I was in high school. I've always done it with Jessica. I've always had certain goals and things that I want to do. And, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment as well. You'll fall off the bandwagon, of course. We're all human. Everyone does this. But then I'll get back on and I'll start writing up goals again. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll try to, you know, uh, you know, set goals again. But my first point that I want to give you, my first tip that I want to give you about setting goals in your life is that our goals need to be immense. Immense means huge, like ginormous. Our goals need to be very, very big in our lives. And I've always done this, even before I really read the Bible and I saw that the Bible actually taught this exact principle. Our goals need to be where they are, they are almost unreachable. They are practically unreachable or they are unattainable. To where it's almost something you feel like you can't even attain to. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. <clears throat> <clears throat> our goals need to be huge. We need to not be aiming for something small. We need to not be aiming for something that is little or something that is easy to attain to. We need to be aiming for something that is extremely difficult. I remember Brother Hall walked into my office one day with me. Do you know what I'm getting ready to talk about right now? There was one day when, when, when I was working at uh, you know, this church in Arizona. And uh, Brother Hall was just asking me a question like, Hey, how do you stay motivated throughout the day? And I said, I'll, I'll tell you how I, I stay motivated throughout the day. You know what I'm talking about now? I said, I, I, just, I just load up <clears throat> at the end of my day when working. I, just, I, I take a, a post-it note and I put a post-it note down and I just write like a ginormous amount of things that I need to get done. Like, th like it's to where it's like almost impossible for me to get it done. And I just write down just this hugely long list. And, to, you know, to where, you know, it's... it's and, and, and to be honest, I almost never got it done. Almost never. But I would, I would just eat through just a ton of stuff. You know, things that would almost take you know, three days to do. Just this huge long list. And Brother Hall went in there and I showed him that list. And it was, it was huge, wasn't it? It was just, it was not, it's not, it wasn't necessarily attainable for one work day. It was just a huge list of things that I want to get done. But I had that scheduled for that one day. That's what I wanted to try to get done. I want you to look with me at Ephesians chapter number 4. It's verse number 11. I want to show you that the Bible actually sets our goal so high that it is 100% unattainable. What you should be striving for in your Christian life, not specific goals, but the overall arching goal is unattainable. Look at verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, talking about uh, the body of Christ, talking about the local congregation. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Then it says this, 
unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So notice what that said. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Matthew chapter number 5 verse number 48 says this. <clears throat> Be ye therefore perfect. Be ye therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now let me ask you a question. Are those two things attainable? Could you ever reach unto the measure and the stature of the, of the fullness of Christ? Could you ever do that in your life to be, able to, to be able to reach unto the life that Christ lived? Let me ask you this question as well because oftentimes the word perfect means complete. Like it says there, be ye therefore perfect. Now if you want to interpret that there as, as, as complete, that, that's fine. I believe that it, it varies. Most of the time it's, it's referring to complete. But even if you interpret that as complete, notice what it says. I had this discussion with somebody one time. Be ye therefore perfect. Then it says this, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So in what way is, is the Father in heaven complete? Do you understand? I had somebody try to argue with me one time that perfect actually means like sinless. It was at the door where this guy's trying to say you need to be sinless. That's what it means to be perfect. And I said, well, okay, let me show you one time where that standard is unreachable and that you will never be able to do it. Because he was trying to say, hey, that's possible. So I took him to this passage. I said, even if you take that interpretation of this passage, it means you need to be perfect like the Father. Do you think you could ever do that? And he's like, blah, blah, blah. he didn't have an answer, of course. So this passage here is, it is, it is telling you to be complete or perfect, however you want to interpret that specifically for yourself. I believe it's complete. Complete even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Is that something that's obtainable to you? Could you be complete in the same way that the Father is complete? Could you ever measure up to or live the life that Christ lived in his life? Notice how that goal is something that is unattainable. That it's something you'll never be able to specifically attain unto. Now I'm going to give you a couple of, 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 uh, of reasons why uh, you need to have these goals uh, to where they are, like I said, unattainable. Number one, it will motivate you. It will give you great motivation. When you have a small goal, it's very easy to obtain. Oftentimes, it demotivates people. It causes people to be unmotivated because they think, oh, that's easy, right? But when you have something big, when you have a big vision in your life, when you have a big goal in your life, wouldn't everybody in here agree that that's much more exciting than a small goal? So what it'll do is it'll light a fire under your rear end and it will cause you to become interested more so in that subject or whatever you are striving for. If you had the goal of just memorizing two verses, like that's my big goal for life, I just want to memorize two Bible verses, is that exciting? But imagine if you had a goal of, hey, I really want to memorize the entire New Testament. Don't you think that that would motivate you a little bit more? So you can see how having a goal that is huge, that feels almost unattainable, how that would motivate you even more so. Now you need to have two different types of these goals. So you need to have what is considered a big goal. This is what I'll do in my life. I'll set up a, a, a just a massive uh, 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 goal in my life that I'm, that I'm striving for. That's my end goal. That is my ultimate goal. That's what I want to reach. Now if you want to consider something like memorizing the whole New Testament, something like that, I, would, I, would, I desire to do that in my life at one point. To memorize the entire New Testament. Now that's a huge goal. Wouldn't everybody in here agree with that? Let me say this too. I'm, and, and I believe this from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes. That every single person that is in this auditorium right now, that is in this church, is capable of doing that. You are capable of doing so much more than you think. Now anyone that ever memorized scripture or, or uh, you know, quite a bit of scripture in their life, at the very beginning, it was extremely daunting, wasn't it? It was very like, it was very, you know, discouraging. You're very, you have a very discouraged attitude. Now, you may be motivated, but you, in the back of your mind, you're like, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to retain. I don't know how much I'm going to be able to memorize. Now, is there anybody in here who's memorized multiple chapters right in a row, maybe books of the Bible before? Just a few people, right? Now, when you memorize that amount of scripture, wasn't that encouraging? Wasn't it encouraging? Like, wow. Did you think in the very beginning that you were capable of that or that you were going to be able to do that as easily as you did? Didn't it end up at the end, didn't you realize like this was actually easier than I thought it was going to be? That's exactly what happened to me. I remember right when I started memorizing scripture, I just started memorizing Bible verses. I started off, you know, because uh, I didn't really have anybody to direct me or show me how. I started off just memorizing uh, the soul winning 
you know, verses. And then I started memorizing any verses that were related, that, I, that were commonly brought up or that were commonly you know, uh, needed to be used while out soul winning. I started memorizing all those. Then I just started memorizing my favorite verses and I just kept doing that. Before I knew it, I saw the list that I had to keep reviewing every other week or every week and I, and I thought, man, that is way, that's way more than I even thought I was going to be capable of memorizing. We have, our capability is far more than, than, it, than we understand. That's the second point that I want to make about that's why you need to make your goals immense. Because if you set the goals to something that where you think that you are capable of achieving, you are actually capable of a lot more than what you think. Now for a couple of reasons. Number one, you just don't even understand your physical capability. But number two, if you are trusting in Christ, you're trusting in God, I actually believe in supernatural power. I believe that God sends His Spirit and helps you spiritually in your life. He helps you memorize things. He brings things to your remembrance. He guides you with His Spirit. He answers prayers. I believe that there is a supernatural God that parted the Red Sea that can help you grow spiritually in your life. And that whatever barriers that you may have physically, He can help you surpass those barriers. So that's another reason why you need to set your goals much higher than what you would think is capable. Now another reason, the third reason why your goals need to be immense is this. Almost no one just in the world, just in general, even in Christian you know, uh, circles and churches, almost no one achieves their goals, do they? When, they, when, when, when the majority of people that are, that are set out to do something that is some sort of a flight, it's some sort of a battle, how often do people achieve their goals? More often than not, people think of all the goals that everyone in this room has had in their life. Now, have you achieved most of those goals that you've, that you've desired to do spiritually? Things that are pretty big goals? No, you haven't. The majority of people fall off the bandwagon. Now, it's good that if you return back to that and you, and you get, acquire that same zeal again. Like, I had the desire to memorize the whole New Testament many times. You know, more than one time in my Christian life, right? And I, and I, and I did well at times. And I, I would, you know, fall off the bandwagon and then I'd do well again. So, this is very common that people will do this. They'll set goals in their life, whether it be secular, whether it be, you know, uh, uh, you know, goals spiritually. And what will happen is, most of the time, the inclination is that people give up, which is not good. But if you set your goal much higher and you don't reach your goal, you don't end up achieving the goal, whether you give up, whether you're just not able to in the first place, I will guarantee you that if you went with the goal that you thought was you know, attainable in your mind, you thought, hey, I think that that's something that I could achieve. I think that that's something that is feasible for me. You would have actually done more than you thought that you could have done. You would have actually have been able to achieve and, and that bar would have been moved much further than what you actually thought that you were capable of in the first place. I want to make an, uh, another quick point. This is still the introduction and then the other points are going to go quick. There's going to be three points in the actual meat of the sermon. Another introductory point is this, that our brethren should not be our goal. When we look around at our brethren, we shouldn't be desiring to be as good as Brother Bops or Brother Ray or Brother Martinez or Brother Hall or whoever it may be. We shouldn't be looking at other people in the church and say, hey, that's what I want to be. I want to be, I want to be able to do as much as they do. We're actually taught not to do this in the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So notice that it's not wise to compare yourself with another person. I'll tell you a couple reasons practically why that's not a good idea because imagine when you're in this church and you're comparing yourself with another person in this church, you may be at, if we're just, if we have a spectrum here, I'm not even going to give numbers for the spectrum, you may be right here on, you know, the spiritual Christianity line, right? You may be right here. Well, if you're down the street in the in, in, in First Baptist Church of, of Jacksonville, and you're comparing yourself with the person that's at the very top there, it's possible, and yes, you know, I'm boasting of our church a little bit here, it's possible if you're, let's talk about Bible memorization, how many people in that church do you think have memorized more than 20 chapters in the Bible? 
First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, the largest church probably, one of the largest congregations. How many people in that church would you say have memorized more than 20 chapters? I'm willing to bet no one has. I'm almost willing to guarantee you. If you want a wager, I don't really bet, but we can call that church and ask them, of course, that'd be ridiculous. But I would almost guarantee, how many churches, let me just prove that point this way, how many churches in Jacksonville do you think has someone in their church that's memorized more than 20 chapters? Very few. So do you, do you see how if you set that bar wherever people are in your church, how that's going to differ, right? So, you know, there's probably many people in this, in this uh, uh, building right now that have memorized more than 20 chapters of the Bible, right? Many people. So if you were to compare yourself, but guess what? There's probably a lot of churches out there that exist where people have memorized 100 chapters, have memorized 80 chapters, 70 chapters, 60 chapters. So do you see how... It, you, it could cause you to even be lazy if you start comparing yourselves among yourself. That's why you're not wise. Because all the standards are different. If we were to look at the amount of scripture that was memorized maybe at the time of, that Paul had memorized or the apostles or the disciples, don't you think that they did a little bit more memorization than the average Christian did? Of course. So you see how when you start comparing us, it doesn't make any sense because the bar is always, uh, it, is, it is objective then at that point, right? Or it's subjective. It gets moved around at that point because it depends upon who in the Christian church is doing memorization and it differs from church to church, right? That's why our goal needs to be Christ in the first place. That's why our goal needs to be something that's, that is just extreme, right? We need, to, we need to have an extreme, a large goal, something that is almost un attainable. And now I'll tell you another reason why you don't need to be comparing yourselves among yourselves. You know what it breeds? It breeds envy. Oh, it may not start out like that. You may just, it may be completely innocent, but over time if you're like, hey, I want to have as much scripture memorized as so and so. I want to be able to memorize as much Bible as this person. Or, you know, I heard they got this, this chapter memorized the other day. I'm going to get this chapter memorized. And then you like walk up and you're like, hey, you ever memorized so-and-so? You knew that they memorized that chapter? Because it just, it ends up breeding envy, right? And then you memorize two chapters and you come up and you're like, yeah, well, I memorized, you know, Psalm 1 and 2, huh? You know, you got Psalm 1 memorized? Well, I did more than that. Whether you, it starts off, it may begin innocent. But that doesn't mean that it's going to end that way. This type, these types of, uh, of things, they end up breeding envy. We shouldn't be comparing ourselves with each, with each other and, and, and trying to do better and then you'll end up trying to come in and just boast about it and brag about it and say, hey, I'm better than them. You know, I'm better than that person. That shouldn't be the type of attitude that we have in the first place. Now, you need to have two different types of goals. So this is the next section and then we're going to move into the meat of the sermon. You need to have two different types of goals. Two different types of goals. Number one, you need to have long-term goals. You need to have big goals. These are the immense goals that I just talked about. You need to have huge goals. These goals are the goals, like I said, that are almost unattainable. Something that is just an extreme feat. It would be extremely difficult to attain unto, right? Number two, you need to have short-term goals. Now, these short-term goals are not entirely different goals than your large goals, your big goals, or your long-term goals. What the short-term goals are, it is your big goal broken into phases. It is your large goal and then it is broken into phases. And let's say that that is memorizing the whole New Testament. I believe that that's a perfect example, Bible memorization. We can use that as, as, as an example this morning. So let's say Bible memorization, let's say that you wanted to memorize the entire New Testament. Well, what you would do is you would obviously set smaller goals right now to where you are memorizing, let's say, the book. if you've never memorized any full book, you could just choose a book out that is a smaller book and, and, and say, hey, I want to have you know, this book, the book of Jude, maybe it's one chapter, I want to have it memorized by the end of the month. Or I want to have it memorized by the end of next month. Let's say you've hardly done any Bible memorization. Maybe it's a child. And you want your child to start off. You want your child to have the whole New Testament memorized by the time they move out. Right? And I want them to begin now. So right now, they're going to be... And they, your kids have you know, plenty of time to... to, to that's, that is even more attainable than, than an older person doing it because we're consumed with other thoughts throughout the days. And we have a lot of responsibilities in our lives. And not only that, 
They have a taskmaster, which is the parent that can force them to do this daily and keep reminding them and making sure that they're doing it daily, right? You have to be self-disciplined as opposed to the child is disciplined by you and you are there to, to constantly monitor them and make sure that they are achieving these things. So that's very attainable for a child to have the entire New Testament memorized by the time that they leave your house. That's extremely easy. By the time that they are 18 or 19, that would not be that difficult. That's a long time if it's a 10-year-old or 11-year-old or something along those lines. But you would take this goal and you would break it up. So if you want to memorize the whole New Testament, you would break that up to where, hey, I'm going to first start with just a small book. And I want to have it memorized by you know, Thanksgiving. I want to have it memorized by the end of the month. I want to have this particular book memorized by this particular amount of time. Now, one thing, also a bit of advice that you need not to do, is you don't, you, you, you must, so, you must set parameters, time parameters on how long it is going to take you to memorize or how long it's going to take you to do your Bible reading, whatever goal that it may be. You have to have some sort of time, time restraints. You must. Because, you know, human tendency again is to give up. Human tendency is to become laxed and, and you know, and, uh, and laid back at least. Maybe not just completely giving up, but laid back. So what people do when they don't have any sort of time restraint, what they will do is they will, um, they'll keep pushing that, that date. They'll keep pushing the, like, like a loose date that they have in their mind. It's not that big of a deal because I wasn't exactly sure when I was going to do it. It would have been nice to have it done by the end of the year, but... You know, I got a lot going on. I got, you know, I'm going to just give myself, you know, a little bit more time. You need to set these time, you know, constraints. I meant to say time constraints in your mind, and they need to be unbudging. You need to understand that I am not moving off of this particular time. Now, when I ended up moving to the church in Arizona, someone uh, gave me a tip at that time that I never really practiced in my life before and I realized that this was this was smart advice once he said it and I may have used it not knowing in certain areas but I don't ever remember ever using it. it it was just if you want to do something you really want to do something that's kind of far-fetched that feels like it's really difficult you need to make sure that you're disciplined enough to set a date and make sure that you know that that date is not changing like I am not budging on this so when I ended up moving to Arizona I set a date and I said we are moving on this day and it is not changing. Like we are for sure. Now whatever we have to get done, even if we run into some sort of problem, I'm not pushing this date back. We're not waiting another month if something happens with, you know, whatever it may be. You know, uh, the, the truck, the rental truck. We're figuring out a way and we're moving. Even if we have to just drive the vehicle and buy new clothes or whatever it is there. I was not budging on the date. No matter what. No matter what happened. Because you know what would have happened? When you understand, hey, I can move that date around. You say, hey, we'll move next month. And then you know what happens next month? Well, you've already budged once. See how much easier it is to go ahead and push that date again? Okay, so I'm just going to, we'll, we'll move by the end of the year. We'll move by, by the time we're 35. We need to make sure. And you need to not allow other things to uh, uh, get in the way. Because what you end up doing is say, hey, I'm going to get this straightened out before I do this. What are your priorities? Notice how that comes back to that. What are your priorities? Are your priorities spiritual or are they financial? Are your priorities things of this world or are they things of God? So that's where push comes to shove where you better make a decision now of what is more important in your life because at this point what you're choosing because that perfect day will never come for any, in any area. You say, hey, well, I'm going to start doing memorization at this time of the day once, you know, let's say it's a woman, the kids get out of school or let's say it's a man. Once I finish this project, right, then I'm going to start allotting this time. You'll find another excuse later, whatever it is. Whoever it is, you'll end up finding another excuse later. Just like, hey, I'm moving next month. And then you not end up moving then and you don't move. When that person gave me that advice, I said, hey, I'm setting this date. And I actually gave that advice to a few other people, three or four other people that ended up moving as well. And then one person actually told me that that worked big time. It worked for me. I got the advice from somebody else. It, it works when you, you have to, when you have goals. And that was a goal that I had of something that I was going to do in my life that was very important to me. When you have these goals, you need to make sure you set these goals and that the goals aren't going to budge. They need to stay in place and you're not, you're not moving. They're not allowed to be questioned. 
They need to be landmarks that you cannot move. They need to be landmarks that go down and they stay in place. So your big goal needs to be broken into shorter goals. Now these, these are smaller goals, short-term goals. Your big goal uh, needs to be broken into these smaller phases of smaller goals that you can focus on. Now this is what's very important about these smaller goals. This is how I've always done my, my goal system. These goals need to be attainable. You need to make sure that when you put these in place, you need to make sure that these goals are actually attainable. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why that that is so important. I'll give you an explanation of why, of why that this is so important. You need to, you need to, it, it, this need, these need to be achievable. Number one, the long-term goal just in and of itself can be daunting. It can be discouraging. If you don't break it into... Uh, um, you know, smaller goals. Can you imagine just starting memorizing the whole New Testament and just looking at the whole New Testament every day? And like that's what you're focusing on? And you're not breaking, you're not even thinking about the books, you're just starting like in Matthew chapter 1. Imagine just like removing all the chapters, all the book names, and just like starting in, cha in, in the very beginning. You can't even say chapter 1. In Matthew, the very beginning of Matthew. You know, of what we know as Matthew and just memorizing the whole thing from cover to cover. Doesn't that sound more daunting? I realize when I say that it does. It sounds much more difficult and much more discouraging. But when you, when you break it down into smaller goals, like, hey, I'm going to start with the book of Jude. That in your mind is more encouraging because it's, it's attainable. Because it, it's, it sounds much more attainable and it sounds possible or feasible to the human mind. Number two, not only that, when you complete one phase or each phase of these goals, which are, are achievable or are attainable, it gives you a sense of accomplishment. It gives you a sense of accomplishment and then that is even more so encouraging in your life. It will, once you have memorized, I know when I memorized, I had, I had a plan, I didn't plan on talking about this, but I had a plan to memorize the pastoral epistles and I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. Because I had memorized a bunch of Bible verses and things like that. And I knew I wanted to be a pastor, so I thought it's great to memorize the pastoral epistles if I want to be a pastor. That just makes sense. So I started off with the smallest of them, Titus. And I thought, I'm probably, I never said this out loud, but I remember thinking this. I'll probably end with the book of Titus. This is before I'd ever memorized. This is my first book that I've ever memorized in the Bible. I said, I'll probably end with the book of Titus. So then I memorized the book of Titus. And I was like, man, that was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. It's not that I'm special at all. It's, it's, it's a part of your brain that you're, it's a muscle that you're not using. That's why maybe memorization is difficult for you. It's because you've just never memorized. The more you memorize, the people that, that sit around memorizing things constantly. We, we today in the United States of America, we don't, in modern day, we don't memorize much. But when kids graduated in like the early, like in, in the 1800s and 1900s, they were, they were, you know, made, they were forced, it was mandatory to memorize large documents like the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. They were forced to memorize these things. Thomas Jefferson, I can't remember what it was, but when he graduated in the fifth grade from what we would consider like middle school, or I'm sorry, elementary school, when he graduated in the fifth grade, he memorized some large document. It was like three pages in Latin. In Latin, that's obviously not his mother tongue, you know. That's difficult, that's ex especially in another language. This is what this was common practice in the past. Today, no one memorizes anything. So when I memorized Titus, the book of Titus, for the first time, I was like, I was very surprised with my with what I was capable of doing. Then I memorized, decided, well, then I'm just going to go in order. I'm just going to get a big book. Then I'm just going to go ahead and do First Timothy, and I did First Timothy, and then I did Second Timothy. And by the time I had done finished all three of those books, I mean it probably only took me, which is is longer than I wanted it to take, but it probably only took me a year to to memorize all three of those books. And I was, I was extremely surprised that even the, that I was able to do it, number one, and the amount of time that it took. Now, if I wouldn't have set the goal in the first place of memorizing the whole New Testament, I doubt that I would have even, even said, hey, let's try to memorize the pastoral epistles. You know, and if I would have said, hey, I'm going to memorize the pastoral epistles, I probably would have only memorized the book of Titus and stopped there. But because I had this bigger goal, it caused me to break my goals down into these smaller goals that were attainable. And I saw, hey, this is... This, and then you know what happens? Over time you start realizing that these larger goals are actually attainable. And you're able to slowly chip away at them. 
And after I memorized the third book, I remember having a great sense of accomplishment. And it was the first time that I had ever thought to myself, memorizing the whole New Testament is, is definitely achievable. Like it is something that is really achievable. I had said it before, but it really didn't resonate with me. I hadn't really realized like what I was capable of memorization wise. That's why I say that every person in here, I'm sure, sits in the same boat. If they've never memorized, they're like, man, that would be difficult. I don't know if, I could, if that's even possible for me. It's possible. And once you, you know, would memorize a few books of the Bible or a lot, uh, quite a few chapters uh, uh, of a particular book, you'd realize like, you're, you are capable of way more than you think. And when you break down your large goal into these smaller goals, it ends up... It ends up, you know, number one, it ends up giving you the sense of accomplishment. It's not as daunting or as intimidating as the larger goals, that the, the shorter goals that is. And not only that, it causes, like I said, ending there, the possibility of accomplishing your end goal to then feel attainable. So number one, the larger goal is intimidating and daunting. So uh, the small goal is not as intimidating and not as daunting. Number two, when completing each phase of the larger goal, the smaller goals, once you complete each one of them, you receive a sense of, a sense of accomplishment and that gives you encouragement and it motivates you to keep moving forward. So you must break your large goals down into small goals. And number three, it will then allow you to see more so uh, the, the possibility of achieving. It makes your large goal, your huge goal possible in your mind for achieving it one day, for it becoming attainable. And like I said, you must give yourself a time frame or you'll just keep putting it off and, and changing it. Again, Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now this applies in three different ways. Number one, it applies personally. So we're going to get into the different types of, different areas where you need to be setting goals, right? So we looked at the different types of goals. Now we're going to get into the different areas where you need to be setting goals. Go to Galatians chapter number, actually you turn to Philippians 3 so we can get through this quickly. You need to be setting goals as an individual. Personally in your life as a Christian, you as a Christian need to be setting goals. Just like Paul said, he said, I therefore so run. He wasn't talking about the church at Corinth. He was telling them, hey, you need to run. But you know what he said about himself? He said, I therefore so run. I, talking about himself. He had a goal. He had something that he wanted to achieve. He wanted to obtain to. He said, the crown that ye may obtain, he said. He said, I therefore so run. You're in Philippians 3. I'm going to read to you from Galatians 6, verse number 4. It says this, but let every man prove his own work. Let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Verse 5, for every man shall bear his own burden. You as an individual are going to have to answer for the life that you live one day. You're going to stand before Christ one day and you're going to have to give an answer for your life and what you have done on this earth, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Whether you've wasted your time or whether you've done things for Christ. He knows all things of the heart. Yeah, he's forgiving. He knows all things of the heart. But he's a very austere man. He's an unbudging man. I want you to look with me at Philippians chapter number 3. Look at verse number 13. Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 13. Again, Paul talking about his own personal goals. He says this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Notice verse number 14. He says this, I press toward the mark. That's like a goal, right? I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So what was his mark? Was it something that was easily attainable? It was something that was, that's, that's really never attainable, right? But how did Paul act about his goal? He, he understood that, but he still said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What does he mean by the mark? The goal the goal, right? He has a goal that he's pressing towards. It's the stature, the measure of the stature and fullness of Christ. He repeats this in all of, all of the, the epistles. You can go through all the epistles. You can see these same types of statements where he's trying to achieve unto Christ. Trying to measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He, he says this in almost all of his epistles. Just like he likens it unto the Christian race, the Christian uh, 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 life. He, he'll liken these things unto athletics and sports. The mark is 
a goal. Paul had personal goals in his own Christian life. Now, he, of course, had goals and he had things that he desired for the churches to get done, right? As a leader, he, he looked at the churches and he wanted them and he, and he would write to them and say, hey, you need to work on this, you need to do this. So he had things he wanted them to fix, but he as an individual had goals. You as a Christian, you need to have goals, real goals in your Christian life. Goals that are on paper, goals that are maybe written in your mind, at least mentally, that you know, hey, this is what I'm trying to achieve in my Christian life. If there is no finish line, you're never going to succeed. Without a vision, the people perish. If where there is no vision, the people perish. If you don't have an end goal, you're not going to go anywhere. You don't even have anything to race after or to run after. There's not even a carrot in front of your face that you're trying to obtain unto. If you don't have a goal, I can guarantee you, you will perish. According to Scripture, I can guarantee that you will fail. You will not succeed in the Christian life. Every person in here needs to have personal, individual goals. If you don't have any, you need to make sure you sit down and you set goals in your Christian life. You need to make sure you sit down and you have specific things that you want to get done. Like I said, you need to have large goals you need to, and you need to break those goals down. And these goals need to be you know, virtually feeling like they're unattainable. You don't even think that you can get to them, right? They need to be huge, immense goals. You need to break those goals down into short-term goals. You need to treat these things. We need to understand the importance as well. That's what's motivating about this as also. You're going to die. You're going to be in eternity with these rewards that you earned. All of eternity. I, you know, I can't say that in such a way to wake you up if you're not awake. If it, that, that doesn't help you realize like what that means. Whatever you're given, again, to repeat this, whatever you're given at the judgment seat of Christ, that's what you're going to have in a million years and nothing else. He's not going to... 3,000 years later, hey, you did this other good thing in heaven and give you another reward. That's not how it works. It's for now. You are rewarded for what happens in this life. And once you die, game over. The buzzer rang, you don't get another shot. That's it. It's the one, one opportunity that you get. It's the one, you know, you know like, like Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He always is likening it unto a race. He had real goals that he wanted to accomplish in his life. He, he really treated the Christian life. I guarantee that Paul went into town and said, hey, I'm going to have this city knocked by this time, and then I'm going to be going to that city by this point in time. I, 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 am, I feel very confident that he did. I'm sure that he did. He, had, he wanted to preach the gospel to the whole world. You think he didn't systematically break that down? Without a vision, the people perish. That's how I can back that up. If he didn't have a vision, he wouldn't have succeeded. The only way that you succeed is by having a goal or having a vision. Something that you're seeking after. Something that you want to achieve unto. So you need to have goals personally. I'm going to give you some quick examples. I'm going to read these off and not spend a lot of time. But these, there are basic essentials to the Christian life. There are basic essentials that need, to, that need to be present in your Christian life. Number one, prayer. I mentioned that first because that is one of the most lacking areas of Christians. Prayer. You need to be praying at least three times a day. And I, I would use Daniel to back that up. You need to be praying to at least, at least, at the very least, three times a day. The Bible says pray without ceasing. You know, we need to be, prayer needs to be a major part of your Christian life. I would say at the very least, you need to be praying three times a day. Real prayer in the morning, in the middle of the day, evening. You need to have a real time where you sit down and you pray. This time, I'm speaking, I, you know, I'm sure you do too. You just pray throughout the day, talk to God regularly, just, you know, when you're doing different things. I do that all day, multiple times a day. I mean, literally like 50 times a day, I say small prayers throughout the day. I'm talking about a real time that you set aside to pray to God. That's what, that's what I'm talking about right now. Daniel had three times a day where he got on his knees where he's like in a prayer closet. He's by himself praying to God. You need to be doing that using Daniel, a great prophet of God, as an example at least three times a day. At least three times a day you need to have real prayer. Soul winning. You need to have goals soul winning. Keep track of the amount of people. Just like our church keeps track, keep track of the amount of people you get saved. And Set goals for how many people you want to get saved by the end of the year. Even, isn't even that thought exciting to you? I know it is to me. Set goals for how many, how many times are you going soul winning? Look at your life and see you know, your schedule and see, hey, can I go soul winning anymore? Am I able to do soul winning anymore? Maybe an extra 20 minutes here, another 30 minutes here. If that's not specifically what it is, if you're able, not able to fit that in right now, 
because I understand people's schedules are all different and things like that. Set goals for how many people that you can get saved by the end of the year. Set goals for how many people you can get saved by some specific date. Set goals for how many, start with a large goal, how many people do I want to get saved by the time I die? Now, let's break that down into smaller goals. Let's say that I die, you know, a man's promised, you know, uh, you know three score and ten, right? So let's break that down over the amount of time that, that, that God says that you're going to live your, your life. And let's see what I need to be getting saved by, you know, my birthday. And then I'm going to keep track every year from there. Set goals for soul winning. How many people that you could get saved? Bible reading. Set goals for Bible reading, you know? Uh, uh, set goals for how much Bible you want to have read by a certain amount of time and how many times you want to have the Bible read by a certain age that you are. You know, what would make you happy to how many times you had the Bible read when you're 40? You know, we'll set a goal for that. I want to have the Bible read however many times, you know, 75 times or 50 times or 25 times by the time I'm 40. Set a goal for that and work towards that goal now by making smaller goals, short-term goals. You have a long-term goal, set a short-term goal. Um, you know, not only that, implementing certain things. I've mentioned this a few times in the recent sermons because it seems like it's avoided, you know, uh, uh, oftentimes in preaching and churches. Things like charity and things like that are talked about, but they're talked about in very vain, shallow terms. You need to be finding areas to implement this kind of stuff in your life. You need to be looking for opportunities to be hospitable, to be charitable to other people. Like, look for those chances, and when they're there, take advantage of those types of chances. It's very easy to overlook that kind of stuff, and, and I'll, I'll go through stages where I'm, very, I'm trying to be, you know, uh, very conscientious about my conscientious about my decisions and choices when I'm when I'm making those decisions in, in, in terms of you know being charitable and being hospitable and then sometimes it's it's in the back of my mind I'm not really thinking about it very much right you know it's not up in the forefront of my mind the other day when I was cutting grass we had neighbors moving in and I thought a couple of times I'm gonna go over and ask those people you know whether or not they need help moving in I ended up going over there for another reason when I got over there I was like hey do you guys need any help and thank God they were like no no I'm just kidding they ended up saying no they didn't need any help but I was like yeah, I thought about it a couple times I thought I need to be as a neighbor you need to go over there do things like that you see people broken down I mean honestly I've probably 10 times since I've been in Jacksonville stop just because I've, I've just put it in my mind like when when people are broken down on the side of the road try to help those people because sometimes that you know stop at least they'll tell you like eight out of well I'd say seven out of ten of those times around ten People have just told me, hey, somebody's on the way. Don't worry about it. Almost like, you know, you know, creeper, get out of here, you stalker. Like, you know, people are worried we're on the side of the road, right? So there's been a few times that's happened, but there's been like three times where I've helped people on the side of the road. One time we left church on Wednesday night or Sunday night, I can't remember. These people were broken down, and I helped these guys like push a car for like a half a mile. But then there's been t periods of time where I've driven past people like that. Where it's not in the front of my mind. We need to set goals in our life, like where you're looking for opportunities. Where, hey, I want to try to help somebody, you know, three times this month where you're checking those off. Has anybody ever done anything like that in their mind? Those are the types of things that I'll do for my goals. At least five times, you know, this month I want to try to help somebody. And, you know, one thing that I used to do when I was in uh, Arizona, when I was driving through, I used to love Dutch Brothers, as did a few other people here because it's, it's very good. And when I would go through Dutch Brothers, I would, I would like, I would try to do it like at least once every other week, where I would just purchase the person's coffee behind me, unless they're like going out for like you know 15 coffees for you know work that happened one time, and I'm like, I'm not doing that, you know. So then I was just like, I'll do. I'll, next time I come to Dutch Brothers, that's what I'll do. But I'll just purchase the per just to try to like do something nice for someone like five times a month. You need to be implementing. Stop just thinking, talking about hospitality, hearing the preaching about hospitality, hearing the preaching about charity. Actually, you personally and no one else can do it for you yourself need to start implementing these things in your life and actually putting them into practice. Look at all the virtues in the Christian life. How many of them are you just totally lacking in your life? Isn't that, isn't that embarrassing? I mean, isn't it embarrassing? When I look at things like that, I'm like, man, when's the last time I've done that? It, it cuts me to the heart. It makes me think like, man, I need to start working on that. You know how you do it? Set goals. Really? It may sound ridiculous to you, but I guarantee it works better than what you're doing now. Say, hey, next month, if I'm not a charitable person, next month, five times I'm going to do things that will help me in charity, the area of charity. Next month, five times, whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be financially. Go help your neighbor move in. 
right? Unless they're a couple of dykes or something, don't help them move in, right? You know, tell them about how there's roaches in this house. <laughs> you know, try, try to find like areas where you can actually start putting these things into practice. So you need to have these individually. That was the, the longest one of, of all of these. Number two, uh, you need to be setting goals for your family. You need to have goals for your family. Uh, husbands would be most, mostly responsible for this, but the, the women need to do this for their children as well because the women are the primary caretakers. So they need to be setting goals for their children. Uh, again, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Without a goal, you will not succeed as a family. The people, the family, you will not succeed. So you need to look at your family. You need to examine your family and you need to say, hey, these are areas where we're lacking as a family. We're not praying together. We're not you know, reading the Bible together. I'm never sitting down and actually teaching my sons. I'm never sitting down and actually teaching my daughters. I'm never sitting down and actually teaching my children the Bible. You know, women need to set aside times throughout the day where they're teaching the kids. Men need to, with busy schedules and work, you still need to make sure that you have time where you're praying with your family and where you are teaching them the Bible. That's important when you sit down, hey, let's read the Bible. We're going to read over this, right? We're going to read this passage, right? You know, even if it is, it can be like stressful with kids where they start acting like idiots, you know, Jeremiah specifically, and it, that can be stressful and stuff, and you've got to tell them 15 times, but you know, it's important. It's important to, to, to get them acclimated to this. It's important for, for to have goals and to set a goal, hey, once a week, I'm at least, uh, you know, I'm at least designating an hour a week to teaching my family, husbands. Women, set a goal, hey, 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day, I'm at least going to have 30 minutes a day where I'm doing this. And you set, you're going to have to analyze yourself the amount of time you have, the things that you can do, how your priorities are. And you have to set your own personal goals for yourself and for your family. You know, one of the things that, that we have right now, Michaela is going to be giving the gospel by January 1st. We're, that's one thing we're going to do. Michaela actually was able to get through like three quarters of the gospel when we were in Arizona. You know, but we had, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if you know about it, but a major event that came up in our lives and kind of put a wrench in that. So we got set back for a little while, but, I, you know, we're, I'm going to make sure that Michaela is capable of giving the gospel by January 1st. That's a goal that we have in our family. You know, we, I have a certain amount of pages that my family, that, my, that I make sure that my wife, my daughter reads in the Bible, you know, c consistently. We, we, Michaela started reading the Bible when she was five years old. Now, of course, with children, there's times when she doesn't read and she does all this stupid stuff. But she's going to have the Bible read, what is it, seven times or you already have had it seven? Seven. She's already read the Bible seven times. She's 11 years old. That's big. That's a lot. Do you know why? Because I monitor these little goals of daily. And you know what I do oftentimes? I take that marker, oh, you're reading 10 pages a day? Well, now we're going to bump it up to 15. Now we're going to start doing this, and then the goal just gets bigger. And the vision gets bigger with her capability. There, need, there needs to be leadership in place that's, that's monitoring and making sure that the kids are getting these things done. From the women's perspective, from the husband's perspective. So you, we need to have goals. Set goals for your children when you think that they would be capable of preaching the gospel. How important is that? It's like one of the most important works. I believe the first works in Revelation. I agree with, with, you know, with that interpretation. I think it's talking about preaching the gospel. The, the emphasis by far when Christ left and the works that were given to his disciples. Yeah, he talked about loving each other. But as far as the works and everything that's the most important in the church and what you see talked about, the whole New Testament is about preaching the gospel. That's what matters. Make sure you're, 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 going, you know, you're, you're preaching the gospel. One thing ladies can do is make sure you're going out soul winning. You know, my wife is going to start soul winning again. She's, you know, that's easy because of all the priorities in life, right? You know, or all the, uh, the, the responsibilities in life. It's easy to get priorities mixed up because of how important it is to take care of the kids. And yes, that's spiritual, but you also need to be doing at least, at least some soul winning. So my wife is going to make sure that she's, you know, going soul winning again. That's another thing that she's going to make sure that she's doing. If you remember the passage, it's perfect uh, application for this with Mary and Martha. And Martha's complaining about, you know, uh, uh, Mary, how she's not helping her in the kitchen, basically, right? With the women things. She's not helping her. And she's like, hey, tell her, you know, get her. Jesus, look what she's doing to me. Well, what was Martha doing? Sitting there listening to Jesus. And what does Jesus say to Mary. She, you know, she chose that which is needful. She chose the important part is basically what he's saying. She has her priorities right. So yes, I understand. All of that is important. All of that is, you know, 
You know, work, I, I, I go and, like I talked about last week, I work massive amount of hours. I work a ton, I work like 60 hours on average a week, sometimes more than that. But soul winning needs to take precedence. Soul winning, soul winning needs to be up there on, you know, it needs to be the top priority. It needs, it's one of the most important works. So women, everyone needs to make sure, hey, for our children, that needs to be a major goal. That's what I'm saying. Soul winning needs to be a major top priority goal, even amongst the spiritual list of priorities. It needs to be at the top. Making sure that our kids can go soul winning, all of that. Uh, obviously there would be certain children that would be excluded from this if they're not saved at all. That you need to be focusing on, hey, helping them understand the gospel more. That what needs to be the next goal. You know, that you're going to make sure that they understand the gospel and you're going to get them saved, right? Uh, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1. It's going to be the last thing. So we need to have goals as a church as well. Goals as a church. Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. Acts chapter number 1. We need to have goals for our church. Set goals, and everyone needs to be aware of these goals. Acts chapter number 1. I'm going to use this passage for two purposes. Of course, Christ is, is ascending into heaven, and He's leaving instructions with His disciples with, which considered the church at that time, and uh, leaders of the church. Acts chapter number 1. I want you to look at me at verse number 7. It says this, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now if you compare this passage with Matthew 28 and Mark 16, you'll see that in, Ma in, in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, both of them, he just says, like in Mark 16, for example, the most famous one, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? Matthew 28, he says, go ye therefore, and he says, baptizing them on and on and on in the name of the the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That's you know, also pretty famous. But it, it's, 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 go ye therefore into all nations. Preach unto all nations, right? In Matthew 28. So all nations and all the world. Matthew 28 and Mark 16. That's what? That's the bigger goal. We as a church have a real goal, a real goal of preaching the gospel to the whole world. To the whole world. Now that at this point seems like that's crazy. I want to have a missionary in, in every single country or a church in every country, a church in every city in the United States. That is possible. When churches spawn churches spawn churches, that is more than possible. There are ministries that start up in one generation. One generation where there's a pastor, there's a great congregation, they, he sends out multiple preachers, and it just started there. That's where it started. One ministry, one church... Spawns multiple ministries, multiple churches, and these churches spread. They themselves continue to spawn and have more offspring and more churches go out. They send out more missionaries and, 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 and they just keep spreading. Where they have literally have missionaries in, you know, 50, 60 countries today. And it started with one church. One church. The disciples preached the gospel to prove that that's not too big of a goal. The disciples preached the gospel and pretty much just Paul and his side of the ministry to the entire world. To the entire world. How did they do that? By the power of God. God desires the whole world to receive the gospel. Yes or no? Would you agree with that? So you don't think that he would give you an extra dose of his spirit to enable that to happen if, you, if we were the right church for the job? Of course, if we did on our end what he would want us to do and be, be the vessels unto honor for him that are usable, that, 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 are, that are meat for the master's use, God could, could supernaturally help us to achieve that goal. If we're going to do it in the first place, it would be through God. Paul did not preach the whole gospel to the entire world just because he was a great speaker. He was just, you know, this great, you know, of course he had good attributes, but without God it was not possible. It is possible for this church to, to ultimately be the cause to the effect of preaching the whole gospel to the entire world. That is possible. And, if you, and I've said this before. If you don't think that's possible, you have small goals and you're going to do nothing in your life. You're going to perish. You're not going to succeed in your Christian life. If that's, not, that's crazy, that's, you know, that's not possible, well, you're, not going to, you're telling me right now that you're the exact type of person that's not going to do much in your Christian life. You need to have big goals, you need to have big visions, and you need to actually put them into place and work towards them. Now, in this passage, that's, so that's our church's large goal. I would preach the gospel to every creature in the area of soul winning. That is our large goal. But notice what Christ did here in Acts 1-7. He broke it down into smaller goals. 
It says, witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And then he says this, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You know what he did? You so you have short-term goals and you have long-term goals. Isn't that interesting? So you know what they started with? Jerusalem. Bible memorization. I'm memorizing one book. You have to have small-term goals along with, and this is your large goal broken down into small, short-term goals. Excuse me, small, short-term goals. They are small goals as well, smaller in a comparison. So we need to have, and you know what our, our, our goal right now is, our smallest goal is? Jacksonville. That thing hasn't been updated in a while, but in the next week I'm going to make sure that, that that is updated better. We have put a big chunk. Just this church of just, you know, uh, uh, what was it? At one point we had, uh, what is there, six families in here right now in our church? We had seven at one point, correct? With just six people in a year, if that thing was, also, was colored in up to date, you know, even now, that's, that is impressive, the amount of soul winning that has went on in Jacksonville. Everything in brown is what we want to knock. That is our small-term goal. That's Jerusalem, right? Judea is Florida. Then the United States. And then the whole world. These are goals that we need to have big goals for our church. And if Brother Elliot goes out and starts a church, he'll be taking part. He'll start his own little Jerusalem there. And he'll be desiring also to meet that same large goal of preaching the gospel to the whole world. Having every person having the ability or the capability of hearing the good news of salvation in their life. We need to have big goals for our church. So notice they were broken down into small-term goals. So I have some specific or short-term goals. I have some specific short-term goals, small goals that I want to read off to you. So I want to give you last year's uh, accomplishments when it comes to soul winning and, and, and baptisms. And then I'm going to, as the pastor of the church, give goals for the rest of this year. The rest of the year. Because you have to have something that motivates you. You must have goals or you will perish. You will not succeed. So... First, I'm going to read off to you what we, what we were able to do last year. Now, I don't know if everyone remembers this, but I looked it up. I checked in the bulletin and everything, and it was right around where I thought that it was. So we, kept, we started keeping track of salvations last year in August. Does everyone remember that? It was August 1st. That's when we began keeping track of our salvations. Our church started in March. We began keeping track in August. From August 1st to you know, uh, the end of the year to 2019, we had 158 salvations. 158 salvations. That's quite a few salvations. 158 salvations from August 1st unto the end of 2018. Okay? Throughout the entire time of the church, and of course some of these were members of the church. These were, were children that, were, that got saved and then were baptized. Uh, and then Brother Anthony got saved and he was baptized. No, I'm just kidding. Seven, we had seven baptisms total. People that sit closer get it more. Seven baptisms uh, uh, total. That's what we had last year. Seven baptisms total. So far we have two baptisms this year. Two baptisms this year. And we have... Uh, what was... Oh, it's in the bulletin. We have... 208 salvations. I was thinking I didn't write it down, but I knew I'd have it in the bulletin. So we have, so far this year, we have 208 salvations for the year. Okay? 208 salvations for the year. My goal for the end of the year, so I want you to keep in mind, you always want to do more, right, than you did the year before. You don't, no one just stays the same. You're either going backwards or you're going forwards. People that are staying the same, that are stagnant, are ultimately going to slide backwards, eventually. You know, that's, that's just a known fact of, of progress. So we got 158 people saved from August to the end of the year. So right now, it's September, right? It's September. I want to get another 200 people saved before the end of the year. Now, there are many, there are many factors. We're going to have two soul winning crusades before the end of the year, which are going to help us in this area. But there are many factors on why we have a little bit less this year than we did last. Because if you add up all the, the time, the, the amount of time that we went soul winning this year, and how many numbers we had, 
how many people we have saved this year to date, but then you also take from August to December in 2018. We, we were accumulating more salvations last year than we are this year. But there are some factors. We moved zones, right? And it's, 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 it's very, it's, it's a lot less receptive where we're going soul winning. So we're going we're gonna to make a change to make this more possible to where once a month we're going to be going in to the ghettos every time. More back up towards the ghetto, which is farther away and it's more difficult. But at least once a month we're going to be knocking in the ghettos. At least once a month, the Sunday soul winning time is going to be going to the ghettos. We, the desire to repeat the goal is 200 people saved. That's for salvations for the end of the year. That would give us to date 408 people saved for a year. That's a big goal, man. How good would it be to have 400 salvations at the end of 2019? That's not exciting to you. That's extremely exciting. Not only that, so we had seven baptisms last year, right? We have two baptisms to date this year. So just to be able to defeat that number, and this is the most difficult part is getting people in church, getting them to want to become a disciple. But we need to have big goals, right? We should, by the end of the year, we should endeavor. Our goal is to get... Uh, six more people baptized before the end of the year. Six more people baptized. That's possible. That is possible. Six more people baptized would give us eight baptisms for the year and we'd have one more for this year than we had last. Amen. One more for this year than we had last and if we got 200 people saved, we would beat that number of August to December for last year. We'd beat that number by, uh, what did we have last year? It'd be 44. Because it was 158, right? Yeah, we'd beat it, we'd defeat it by 44 salvations. Right? It was 158, it'd be 42. We'd defeat it by 42 salvations. 42 salvations. We'd have, it, it would trump last year's by 42 salvations. Now, I broke that down, which is not complicated math, but I took that 200 and divided it by the heads of the adults in the church. So I included the women into this. The, the number, when you break that down, that each person would need to get for, for you personally, what you personally need to get saved from today to December 31st is 16 people. Now, does that sound like a crazy extreme amount? Nope. Not at all. Not at all. I'm sure you've had times where you've given the gospel to like five people at the same time. Most people that go soul winning all the time. At least two or three people at the same, just in one time going soul winning. That is entirely possible. For each adult in here to get 16 people saved, that is entirely possible. And, what, and, and when you have goals like this, you know what you end up doing when, that, it, when, you, when it's serious and it starts to become crunch time? Do you know what you end up doing? You end up trying even harder, working as hard as you can. You know what we may end up getting? We might end up getting 190 people saved. But I guarantee you that that will be more than what we would have gotten saved if we weren't shooting for 200. I guarantee you. We might end up getting 175 people saved. It might be 160, but guess what? It'll still, we'll still do better this year than we did last. So as, as a church, I want to set goals for our church for the end of this year to have 200 people saved to date. And I'm going to keep track of that number separately and I'm going to put it in the bulletin so you can see it every week. And I'm going to announce it every week and we're going to look at it. It's going to be right underneath where the... It's, I'm, going to, I'm going to design another column. It's going to be to date, to, from today. To where we can see how we're doing. Our goal is 200 people saved. And then our baptisms, we're going to, we're going to strive as a church to get six people in. Get six people to come in, you know, just grab some bums off the street and get them in here. No, I'm kidding, of course. Get six people to come to church and get them baptized. Take this as a, you, you know what? Use this goal to help you to set personal goals in your life. Hopefully this, this, this sermon and this idea and understanding the importance of setting goals will help you to become a better Christian because that's the goal of setting goals. That's the purpose of setting goals in the first place. It's because it, it gives you something to push towards. Without a vision, when there, where there is no vision, the people perish. 
Where there is no vision, the people perish. When you have no goal, you will not succeed. You don't even have a finish line. If that's where you're at as a Christian, there needs to be a change today. The church has goals. You need to have goals as an individual. And you need to have goals for your family. There's a great importance in setting goals. There's a crown to win. There is, you need to be striving for the mastery. It needs to be a real competition that you are striving for. Right? You need to not be, I don't want to just pastor some dead as a doornail, lame, ordinary church. That's not the kind of church that I'm looking to pastor. So if you're that kind of church member, find another church. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for regular church members. That's not what I want. I don't want just every week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, just coming to church. I want a church that is desiring to do huge things for God. This is a big God that's talked about in this Bible. This is a big God, a powerful God that can do great things and He uses men time in and time out, one story after another to do amazing things. I want to be a church that's used to do great, huge, big things. Huge things. I don't want to be just some rinky-dink church around the corner. You know? It, you know, it has nothing to do with size, but even if we stayed small, which I, I, you know, our church will grow, I know that, but even if we stayed small, we could still do huge things. We still have more, I'm sure we have more salvations than 99% of the churches in Jacksonville. Let's do double that. Let's have double than what we have now. If we're just barely defeating some of these churches, let's do double than what they're doing. Let's do five times in five years. Amen. Let's do ten times what they're doing. When ten years go by, let's, let's, let's just you know, keep setting the goal higher and growing the bar or, or, or raising the bar higher every, every ten years, every twenty years. Stop having small goals in your Christian life. We serve a big God, have big goals, and trust in Him that He is able to do these things. Amen. You know, uh, we need to pray for our church. We need to pray for other people in the church. We need to motivate each other. We need to be pushing forward in the Christian life, doing everything that we can. That needs to be our priority. That's what we need to be focused on in our Christian life, is doing more for God. In every area of our Christian life, we need to be moving forward. Not moving backward, we need to be moving forward in large strides, in large leaps. We serve a big God. Let's do big things here at Valley Baptist Church. Let's bow our head and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word.